Open your Bibles, please, to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. I speak this morning on the key to prosperity. This is sermon number 10 in the series on Christ the Master Key. I shall give two others tonight and Wednesday. I believe that I could speak on the theme perhaps for the rest of my life if that was the choice and my choice for doing so. The center of all of our thinking, all of our work is the Lord Jesus. I want you to think very solemnly this morning upon this theme as we have the key to prosperity and what God says about it. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. This portion out of Malachi chapter 3. Just to call to your attention, Matthew, uh, correction, Mark chapter 12, Mark 12, verses 41 to 44. When Jesus had a word to say about the matter of giving, on the part of this poor widow and who, sh- who threw in two mites, he said, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more, more in, than all they which have cast into the treasury. For the old did cast into their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Quite an interesting statement given by the Lord Jesus in Mark chapter 12. Now listen to this from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8, if you read it all. 2 Corinthians 9. But this I say, he would sow sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he would sow bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. This is enough to start us in our thinking for this morning. This is one of the strangest days in all of American history. It's a day of high salaries, but at the same time many are losing their jobs, their positions. they are cutbacks in many areas of life and business especially. We have cars, they say about two cars for every family. Money for gas, but no gas. Motels by the thousands all up and down the highways of this country, everywhere. And yet now the motels are crying. They say that their business has been cut back by almost 50% because of what's happening this energy shortage in the nation. The cost of food has risen tremendously in the past six months. I did not do this, but they tell me if you stand at one of the cash registers in a supermarket and see what people are paying... What large checks are written out, what uh, enormous bills they are handing out for the food they purchase. And I know, it's, I know it's true. I have had some experience once in a while when I travel in these various meetings. I speak in Phoenix tomorrow night in Orlando a few days ago, and I ordered for my room. I didn't want to go down to the dining room. I was scared to. Too many candles, too much liquor. So I said, just send me a hamburger and a cup of coffee. They did. That's what I got exactly, a hamburger and a cup of coffee. I got the bill, too, $3.17. That was the worst hamburger I've ever had in my life. I made up my mind not to eat with that crowd again. But uh, this is everywhere, the same thing around the entire country. I was interested in the church bulletin coming to me and about the story of the farmer went in to buy a car. Maybe you saw it. And uh, they said the car cost so much. Then they began giving the extras that go on. Everything from radio to heaters and air conditioners and all of it kept adding it up until after the addition was given, the car was quite expensive. It cost lots of money. But he had to have it, so he bought it. Just a few days after that, the car dealer from whom he bought his car came out to the farmer's farm and said this, He said, Sir, I have a small farm, not much, just a little place. I need a cow on the farm, and I'd like to buy one from you. He said, Could you sell me one? And the farmer said, Yes, I can. He said, Well, I'd like to buy the best cow I can get, the best cow you've got here, and if you'll just tell them the best milk cow you've got, and if you'll fix it. He said, Just a second. 
farmer took out his pad and his pencil and began writing it down. In a few moments, he said, now here's the cow that you want. Basic cow, $200. <laughs> Two-tone exterior, $45. Extra stomach, $75. Product storage compartment, $60. Dispensing device, four spigots at $10 each, $40. <laughs> Genuine cowhide upholstery, $125. Automatic fly swatter, $35. Dual horns, $15. You have a man bill for $595. So that's the cost of the cow if you want it. Well, these are changing times. We can see this all around us. But my friends, there are some things that do not change. Sin is still sin. Still sin. The need of man is still the same. Man is lost. He needs salvation. God's way of saving men is still the same by faith in Jesus Christ. Now this morning I'm touching on a matter that I think is wonderful. To me it's interesting, greatly interesting. What am I saying? The giving of man to the work of God. Your gift to the, to the work of our Savior. Here's a sacred subject, just as sacred as prayer and the Spirit's filling and soul winning, all the same. The matter of your giving, the giving of your money. This matter of giving in our church, taking an offering, is just like singing a song, just like praying a prayer, same thing. Just like preaching a sermon, same thing. And uh, we've got to come to the idea of getting hold of what God wants us to do, and with love and devotion of heart, see the work of God, all of it, and say, Oh God, take my life and use it now for thy glory. A man was praying the other day in a certain place where I was in a meeting, <clears throat> and I listened to him as he prayed. It was an humble prayer, but I'll be fra frank with you. When he prayed, something happened. It, it, didn't, it didn't say anything uh, so strange about it. It was just uh, an average prayer by a man. But there was something about the man's sincerity, the simplicity of his tones, of his, of his words, and the general attitude of what he was doing in a public place. Until I felt as he prayed that I was alone with the Lord, as I said in the introduction this morning, and I could feel the presence of God. Now, I thought of this. I said, this, isn't this something wonderful that a man can stand here on this earth, a little man, he was just a little fellow, member of the church, didn't seem too impressive in appearance, and yet could stand on the earth and talk to God in heaven. That's great. That's what you can do when you pray. And my friend, you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You simply pray and trust God. Have faith in God and pray about every single need you have. And God hears from heaven. You are just a little person here among the millions of this earth. And yet God in heaven hears. Now that's amazing, but here also is something that's wonderful. I'm impressed about the matter of giving. When I place an offering in the plate as I did this morning, I have a part in all the missionary work of the church, 256 of them out of this church. I have a part in all the 64 chapels we operate at this time. I have a part in the two rescue missions, one downtown, one in Dalton, Georgia. I have a part in the radio ministry. Everything we're doing, all of it, I have a part in every single bit of this. And this is great. And uh, here is my part. This is my... Oh, you say, but Brother Robertson, some things don't go just right. I'm not always satisfied. That doesn't bother me at all. I don't worry about that part of it. I'm just asking that, that the job be done, that people get saved, that souls are hearing the message of Jesus Christ that we're sending it out to the ends of the earth. That's all that concerns me. And that's what should concern you, the matter of our giving. Now, I wonder if I could ask us a few questions, give some points on this very quickly. Number one, how should we give? First, give in the light of great scriptural happenings. How should we give in the light of great scriptural happenings? Pay no attention to the gifts of the, of the others, but think of your giving. In the light of what has happened, what God has done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ, given the light of the anguish of Gethsemane, where Jesus bowed and prayed, Father, thy will be done, and where he sweat great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Given the light of Gethsemane, given the light of Calvary, Christ died for our sins. There they crucified him. He died for you personally upon the cross of Calvary. Give in the light of the empty tomb. How blessed is that empty place. He arose. Lives triumphant at God's right hand. Again, given the light of the Great Commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In the light of that, give. 
and rejoice in your giving. Again, given the light of Pentecost, that great day when the Holy Spirit came down upon men with mighty power, and He still comes to fill us in this day and hour when we surrender ourselves to Him completely. Again, given the light of the second coming of Jesus Christ, He may come in any moment. Jesus said, Watch therefore, no man knows the hour of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, given the light of great scriptural happenings, things of the past and things of the future, and rejoice in this as you give. And when you give your offering every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and when you come before God, then given the light of all that God has done for you through Jesus Christ, the blessed Son of God. Now, secondly, give in the light of His express command. I believe the Word of God. Old Testament, New Testament, take it all the same. I don't argue about this. Somebody said, how do you prove? I don't prove tithing. Why don't you ask me how to prove uh, salvation by grace? I don't prove that. I accept that. I accept the whole Bible in the same way, all of it, all the way through. And I believe that every child of God should be a faithful tither and more than a tithe because God has saved us and because we're sinners saved by grace. The grace of God has been manifested to us and we should be giving. And I give according to the light of His express command as given here in Malachi 3.10. I've listened to all the arguments, pro and con, everything in the world. This is the Word of God. I take the Word of God as it is, and we urge you to be a tither and to bring your tithes and your offerings into God's house. I don't care whether it's a dollar, a thousand dollars, or ten thousand dollars. You're to bring it. Some fellow said, I make too much money. Well, isn't that a shame? Isn't that a shame? And I can't tithe. Why, I'd be wrong. That I had a man to say that to me in, in a certain town. He said, my, my, my income is such that it would be, wouldn't be fair to the church. I said, be fair to our church. We'll take what you've got and send it out to the ends of the earth. Send out more missionaries, get more things done for the glory of God. Or another fellow may say, mine's too small. No, you take what God says in the Word of God, one-tenth of your income, what God has given you, and give this back to Him. Now, I believe that God has a pattern for all things, has a pattern for the New Testament church. What it is, what it's to be, what it's to do. A New Testament church, and this is one of them right here. He has a pattern for preachers and deacons. Two officers of the New Testament church, not only two, not uh, Sunday school teachers and others. They're, they're, they're extra, you know, but you're maintained to by the Bible or preachers and deacons, plain to sit out. They're to be saved men, they're to be separated men, they're to be faithful men, they're to be loyal men. This is always true. And every preacher is to be an example, and every deacon is to be an example to others. And this is it. Now, this is God's plan. This is His plan and pattern for preachers and for deacons. Not like the preacher up in North Carolina that I read about, who went to a hotel where they were accustomed to always to let the preacher stay free. And when he got through with his four or five days stay in the hotel, they gave him a bill. They said, why? I understood that, that a preacher didn't have to pay anything here. They said, we, you don't look like a preacher. Said so you went to the table, you never returned thanks once. When you finished your meal, you smoked a big black cigar. When you told jokes, you didn't sound like a preacher. Here's your bill. He, they said, you pay like any other sinner. Huh? That's right. And preachers ought to be different. And the Bible identifies it. And deacons are to be different. And the pattern's been laid for us in the Word of God. We're getting ourselves in a mess. The Baptist Church the other day ordained a woman. There are seven women ordained now, and I don't believe in any of it, of course. I believe in the Bible. A woman has no business trying to be an ordained preacher. They ordained a woman. They didn't know it at the time. I shouldn't even say it to you. I didn't say where it was. Didn't say anything at all. I said the ordained a woman the other day, and she was four months pregnant and unmarried. But she was ordained in a public ordination in a big Baptist church. See what I'm getting to? I'm saying, dear friends, we've got to go according to the pattern of God. For preachers and for deacons and for all of our work, and God has a pattern for baptism for the Lord's Supper. Just what we're to do in all of this. And He has a pattern for our giving. Praise God. And the pattern's been laid for us in the Word of God, and we simply do what God says, and God gives His blessing. God is waiting to bless all of us. He said, you just come and take my way. You give your tithes and your offerings to the Lord's work. And He said, I will bless you. I'll take care of you. I'll provide for your every need. And all you have to do is just go and do it. Just prove it. Say, Lord, here I take your word. I believe what you've said, and I'm going to accept it and go on the way. Now, no one had to persuade me into tithing. I'm not, I'm not sure I ever heard a sermon about tithing before I started tithing. I simply read my Bible as a young boy preacher starting out, and I said, this is what God said, this is what I'm going to do. And my convictions came from the simple reading of the Bible, and that was all. And when I went to my first church in Memphis, Tennessee, had an old Chrysler car that my dad bought for me, cost $110, broke down 50 miles out of town, had to repair it every single service station I found, and uh, finally got to Memphis, Tennessee, had 15 cents left. 
I went to the YMCA. They let me in for nothing to come in and assign the ticket to pay the bill, which I intend to do, of course. I got walking on the street the first day I was in Memphis, Tennessee. Never will forget. Depression days. Boy, they were rough days. And I no sooner got on the sidewalk, the fellow approached me. He said, I'm hungry. He said, I want something to eat. And I said, well, sir, you sure come to a poor fellow for that. I've got 15 cents. And he, you know what he said to me? He said, that's enough. The rascal. And the next thing I knew, we had gone a little hole in the wall down. I can take you right to the place now on, on the street in Memphis, Tennessee. He went into a little hole in the wall, and he said, I'll just have a bowl of soup. He said, mister, he said, I'm just starving to death. I bought him a bowl of soup for a nickel. Then I sat there and watched him eat it. When God all through, I said, do you got a place to stay? He said, no, sir. He said, I wish I did have. I said, you can stay with me. I didn't think to ask anybody. It was all right. I just said, come on, let's go down the room. So I went back to the room at the, at the Y and uh, got in the room and had prayer together. And I talked to him. He said, yes, I've been saved. But I've gotten far away from God. I said, what are you doing here in, in Memphis? He said, I came here with a crowd of fellows. He said, we plan to do something awful tonight. And he said, I'm glad I'm with you. He said, we plan to rob the Breeze department store tonight. And he said, I'm here. And he said, this, this is the best place in the world for me. And he told his story. And listen, St. with that night, we had a blessed time in prayer. A stranger to me. I didn't know I wouldn't do it again, maybe in the same way. Wouldn't think of doing it. Might be afraid to do it now in this present hour. But that day I, I felt I could. And they did. And helped him. And yes, they did. The breeze store was robbed that night. And the, the announcement of it in the paper the next day, that boy was scheduled to be one of them in the crowd, but it escaped because of being with me. Wait a minute. I'm just showing you what God can do. I didn't have anything. Went out to preach from a church on the first Sunday. They paid me $50 a month. Not a week. A month. Had to have an old car to get around in, to get the little country church, 32 people in the Sunday school the first Sunday. And I said, now, Lord, this is your business. And they gave me 50 a month, and I divided up and gave them a tithe every Lord's Day. Every Lord's Day, and you've heard my story 10,000 times since I came here in 1942, but it's still just the same. God supplies, God provides, and He did for me. I didn't know how I'd make it. I had no way of knowing at all. I went from the YMCA downtown to a little home and the top room of a beautiful big house on Snowden Circle in Memphis, Tennessee. Got the little room, got up there, and I said, Lord, just take care of my needs and I'll keep on working as best I can. And the money was gone. All of it was gone. You've heard the story. You know what it is. You know the ending of it all. And I waited upon God and said, Lord, you'll have to help me. I woke up one morning, got out of bed, and came to the door and found a little white envelope under the door. I went out in the hallway to see if anybody lost anything, and they said no one lost anything. So I looked inside, had a dollar bill, and said, thank you, Lord, it's for me. That went on for 19 mornings. I picked up a dollar bill every morning under the door, just one dollar per day in an envelope, all sealed in a plain white envelope under the door every morning for 19 mornings. I picked them up. I wasn't too curious. I was just eager that it keep on going. I wasn't going to stop anybody from doing anything. And I said, let it keep on coming, Lord. I wasn't married then, but been married is ended after two days. My wife been sitting up all night watching for the envelope under the door. And uh, so I said, uh, I'll just uh, watch the thing, let it come, and I did. Then I set a little trap and found the person putting it there. I'm not going to that story, but my, my, what a story. I set a little piece of wood up on the side of the door. If anybody touched the door, knock it over, make a little noise, wake me up, I hope. I went to the door about 2 o'clock in the morning when it came a noise. There stood a little woman bending over Mrs. Kate Barker, the wife of the president of the University of Kentucky. Judge Henry S. Barker was one of the greatest presidents the university ever had. He passed on. She came to Memphis to live. She heard about my needs. She wasn't a Baptist, a Christian, but not a Baptist. And she said, I want to help him. And she decided to give me a dollar every night. And so between midnight and 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, she'd get out of bed and come there and slip the dollar on the door. That was smart. If she'd give me $5, I'd trade in cars. I mean that. I, I'd been so extravagant if I'd gotten, she gave a dollar a night. That's all. And uh, she said, I know I can trust him, but I better just make it safe for him. So a dollar a night. And there it was. When I opened the door and she stood there with the envelope in her hand at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, she said, son, here's your dollar. If you ever tell a soul, never give another penny as long as you live. I said, don't you worry, ma'am. I never tell a soul. And until she died, I never told my story even and couldn't do it. What am I saying to you? I'm saying this that God supplies... And you honor God, simply do what God says, and God will bless you every single time. Now, my friends, give in obedience to Him and the express commands of our Savior, and rejoice in your doing it. Then again, give in the light of, dras of the drastic need of man. Man's a sinner, man's lost, man's condemned. He's helpless, he's got to have help. But man is worth saving, and God says it. And Jesus proves that He died upon the cross to save poor lost man. 
And the eternal God said, I want to help. And I want to help man. I want man to be saved. I want my family to be together. I want to bring them together in one in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we give that we might minister to man and his need in this hour through the mission downtown, through our chapels, through our, through our missionaries on foreign fields and Camp Joy. All we're doing that we might minister. Now, why do we give that others might hear the gospel? Why do we give that others might have a part in this great message of our Savior? That they might hear and understand and be saved by their simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now men are lost, whether Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or Catholics or Episcopalians. They're lost without Jesus Christ. The church can't save them. Salvation's through faith in Christ, not through any church membership. They're lost and condemned. They need Jesus. How pitifully, oh, listen to me. What you read in the newspaper is just a part of the awful story. You hear about the pilots being killed the other day and the fellow coming in? Huh? You read newspapers on that just in the last few hours? The girl out in California kidnapped. The editor of the paper in Atlanta, Georgia. Just a few things. This is a drastic, evil, dirty, nasty world. With all the beauties of God around us. With everything that He's done for us, and yet man is so far from God. And that's what we're doing. We're giving because of the drastic need of man. I just happened to run across the story, a true account of a happening in Newark, New Jersey. And when I read the thing, I couldn't believe it. They told my little girl, 12 years old, coming home from school. She got home and she told Daddy, I said, Daddy, I want you to give me some stuff to take back tomorrow. I said, they're having a, a food drive and I'm to take so-and-so. And she listed what she had to take back the next, just a few articles of food, canned goods and so forth. She was to carry back to the school for the food drive the next He said, you're not going to do it. He said, we have needs of our own. We're not going to give anything away. And as a child of 12, she began to beg and said, Daddy, but I've got to. The teacher told me I had to. And she said, I must have it. And the story told what happened. And she kept on begging, and the father became infuriated and took a paring knife and drove it into the child's heart and killed her. You said it couldn't happen? Oh, yes, it did happen. It was on the front page of a newspaper. The father killed his own daughter because of an argument, a 12-year-old child argument about a little bit of food stuff, a can of goods to go to the school to help the poor. Ah, oh, listen, the drastic need of man, man's a sinner, man's wicked, man's lost, man's undone, and his only hope is in Jesus Christ the blessed Son of God. And we ought to give in the light of our love for Him. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Love is the desire to give. And if you love Him, then you want to give. If you love Him, you want to live for Him every day. You want to serve Him. And this is it. Give in the light of your love for Him. And let Christ have the first place in your life. Give yourself to Him. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Give yourself to Him. A French proverb says, He gives nothing who does not give Himself. Give yourself to Him. All of your life, every energy you've got, every talent you've got, give yourself to Him. All of your time, give it to Him. Give your possessions to Him. He owns everything. The cattle on the thousand hills, the silver and the gold are mine. It's all His. Give it to Him. Give it to Him. It belongs to Him. You're just a steward of what you have. Give your ambitions to the Lord. Ambitions. Give them all to Him. Have ambitions. Uh, ambitions, young people, but give all of this to Him again. Give because you're important in God's sight. See, you're somebody. My dear friend, get this in your mind and heart. You're somebody. And you're important. And God wants you to be in the center of His will. And God wants to use your life. Give because of your love to Him. If I were to ask you this morning, every person in this audience would say, I love Jesus. You would. You'd say, I love God. I love the Bible. You'd say it. You'd say, yes, I love Him. But listen, are you expressing that love by your gifts? Are you doing as God commands us to do in the Word of God? Or have you turned away? You see, you are a definite part of God's eternal purpose. And you've got a place. I've got a place. And I've got to fill that place that God has given me until God takes me out. And this is mine day by day. You have yours. I care not who you are, boy, girl, man, or woman. I care not how poor or how rich you may be. You have a place and God says you are important and I want to use you. And if you fail, some part of my work fails. You're important. You're somebody. Now the church goes on. We'll keep on going when one stops, another stops, another stops. We keep on going, but that's not it. I'm talking about you and God and how important you are to the Lord. I like the story told about the putting of the telephone cables from this country to Europe. Well, you talk about a story. They put down cables in the bottom of the ocean for 2,250 miles. 
and double cables, telephone cables. They finished them up from this country all the way into Europe. And when they finished, their first telephone calls were made, and they charged 75 dollars for three minutes on the telephone when they began. Then they dropped it down to 25, then to 15, and to 9, maybe even lower. I do not know now. But here's what they said about the telephone cables. They said if one cable goes out, just one goes out, the whole thing is gone. They put them down guaranteeing them for 20 years that they said if one cable fails. If one portion of the cable fails, then the entire thing is out. But they put it down with a guarantee that it stands there. Ah, listen to me. You're important. You're important. In the service of God and the work of God, you're important. And you must say, Oh God, take my life and use it for thy glory. I give myself to thee. There's a key. A key. And the key is your obedience to, my, to our blessed Lord. Obey Him and do what He says. And love Him with all your heart. And serve Him with all of your heart. And give your best to Him and trust Him implicitly, hour by hour, moment by moment. He never fails. A man was making a journey in the Alps. They came to a certain place and the journey and the guide was directing. They were crossing a little chasm. The guide said, the only way that you can do this is for you to put your foot in my hand and I'll let you step across. I'll hold you up while you step to the other side. And the tourist, the traveler said, no, sir, I wouldn't trust you. I could not trust myself into your hands. If, if, you, if you fail, then I'd, I'd fall. I'd, I'd lose my life. I should not trust. And the guide very humbly looked up and said, sir, I've been doing this for years. I've never lost a man yet. Go ahead. I've never lost a man yet. Wait a minute. He could lose, but praise God, Jesus can't lose. Jesus can't lose. He saves, He keeps, He satisfies. He answers prayer. He supplies all of our needs. Oh, my friend, be your best for God. Be a faithful believer. Be a tither and plus. Be faithful in service unto Christ. The key, the key to prosperity for your life and mine is obedience to our blessed Savior. Let's bow in prayer.